And since it is two o'clock, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NEA Big Read Girls Do Science program. Um, my name is Chelsea and I'm a museum educator at the Florida Museum. And I'm so excited to introduce you to the first virtual Girls Do Science program um, in partnership with the Alachua County Library District and funded by the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read. So last year we hosted this event in person and it was so fun. And we're hoping we can recreate some of that energy here today. So um, like I said before, you can go ahead and use the chat and tell us a little bit about yourselves. Since we can't see you, we still would love to hear from you. So you can do that now. Um, you'll also notice that you're muted with your cameras turned off. Um, and this is because we're using a Zoom webinar. So we'll be using the chat throughout the program um, and you'll be able to ask scientists questions through that. Um, and just make sure that you're addressing it to panelists and hosts so everyone can see what you have to say. Um, so you can learn about this event and other series in um, the NEA Big Read program by following the links that um, my chat assistant is gonna put in the chat um, throughout the event as well. Um, so just before we get started, um, I wanted to let you know about some other really cool stuff going on. Um, so next, well, I guess it's, it's this upcoming Friday actually, um, we have Emily Grassley and she is a host of a uh, YouTube show and also a TV show called uh, PBS Prehistoric Road Trip where she goes and learns all about different fossils. So maybe some of you said fossils were your favorite thing to learn about. Um, and she's gonna be giving a talk that's gonna be really great for um, all, all ages and families. Um, so that'll be next Friday, um, this Friday, gotta get that right, um, at 7 p.m. And then, uh, on March 27th, we'll be having the Finding Wonders Children's Book Meetup. So maybe some of you picked up this book when we were doing the book giveaways with the library. Um, so we'll be talking to a paleontologist at this event, as well as the author of the book. Um, and if you haven't downloaded a copy of the Girls Do Science activity book that goes along with this program, please make sure you do so after we say goodbye today. Um, all of the activities in this book were created by current scientists for all of you future scientists. Um, and some of those scientists will actually be the ones talking to you all today during this program. So super cool. There's over um, 60 pages of really fun stuff to do. So make sure you check out that book later on. Um, so before we get started, I wanna play a little game. So I'm gonna give you all a couple seconds and look at the photos on these faces and think to yourselves, who in this photo is probably a scientist? So just gonna give you a couple of seconds here. Pick out in your mind who might be a scientist. All right, I think that was enough time. Um, so if you've been following along in our Big Read series, you'll know that all of these women are scientists, which is so cool um, and really shows us that all kinds of people can be a scientist and you can study so many different things. Um, so to kick us off today, I'm going to show you guys a short video. It's only about two and a half minutes um, about one of our museum scientists. Um, her name is Adania, and she actually contributed to the activity book that I just told you about. Um, and she's going to remind us why it's so important to um, celebrate women and girls in science. So here it goes. We had this summer camp at the University of the West Indies, which is the University of Finland, and it taught us about the natural world, things I didn't even know existed. When I learned that through the camp, that was kind of what got me to marine biology as somebody from Trinidad and Tobago. The fish I'm studying is Ethiosoma fusiforme, and that's a swamp darter. I'm doing a comparative live fish study. I'm comparing northeast populations in the US to southeast populations. I am the only female in my lab here at UF. I try to make sure that people know that I'm not just a woman, like I can do the things that anybody else can do. This is the notion that we can't necessarily do what men do to some extent, and it, I think it's changing, like the scaffold is changing, because like I think people are starting to actually realize that this does exist, this gender inequality in science and in ideology, and so the fact that they're talking about it publicly, like, I think that's a step in the right direction. 
it's still not diverse it's, it's majority white be it male or female and so and i think that's important for females is to see other females in positions that you might want to be in or doing things that you think you want to do and it's the same for gender as well as diversity in terms of being a biologist a lot of it comes with credibility so how credible are you and so to get that credibility i needed to educate myself so that i can educate others the ultimate goal is to open a research aquarium slash museum in Trinidad that will allow folks to be able to explore and enjoy the environment I definitely feel like I've progressively moved forward, but there's definitely a lot more progression to do, to make. There's never a point where you're like, okay, I'm done. I'm on the step where it's like, I need to get this publication, I need to make sure what I produce is on par with what everybody else has done. I think I struggle in that. I don't want to ask too many questions because I want to feel I can do it myself. And I wonder like, if I was a male, would I ask more questions? And I don't know. I used to always write in my essays, I want to reach my fullest potential. I don't know what that is, but I want to get there. Like, whatever that is, that's what I want to be. I think it's possible. It's definitely possible. All right, guys. One second. Try to get us to the next slide here. Awesome. So I hope you all enjoyed that quick video from Adania. Um, it, she really inspires me to want to be the best person and scientist that I can be. And I hope she inspired all of you as well. Um, so for today, um, we are going to have four different scientists tell you all about what they do and show you some really cool stuff. They have some really awesome things planned for you all. Um, so we have Jade, Maria, Fiona, and Tyler talking to you. Um, and at the end of all of their presentations, that's when we're going to be able to ask them some questions. But if you have questions that you think up during um, the time that they're talking, make sure you're putting those in the chat because we're going to put those all together so I can ask them at the end. So feel free to put your questions in at any time um, and we'll we'll be really excited to answer them when we're when we're finished letting them um, show us stuff. Um, and then at the very end of the program, um, we're going to have a survey um, and this is going to come in the chat and if you miss it, it'll come again in an email. Um, and the reason I ask you to take this survey is because we want to make these programs the best they can be. And so when you get this survey, um, any kids, if you have um, grown ups with you that you can help you do this, um, but it's just asking you if you like the program and what kind of stuff you would like to see the museum do in the future. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen sharing and invite my first scientist, um, Jade, to join us. Um, Jade, are you there? Hey, how are you? Great. Awesome. Jade is here and Jade is um, coming in with us from the Santa Fe Zoo. Um, and Jade, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions before you tell us some stuff about zoo science. Um, so Jade, what got your interest in science? Um. I'm really lucky to be part of a time where as a kid, it was the go out and play until the street lights come on. Um, and I, from a very early age, just have lots of memories of, you know, jumping on logs and watching bullfrogs jump out and lining up roly polies and, you know, just looking underneath things to see things closer. And that definitely started sparking my interest in, in life, in science and, it actually took me a really long time to figure out that that's what I wanted to make a career. I just didn't know how to define it. And um, it wasn't until my late 20s uh, that I discovered what zoos do um, in the science field. And I was incredibly interested. And um, and now I, you know, I made it my life and my career. And so it, it, it started very young. That's for sure. That's so cool. Um, and I, we're excited to hear more about what zoos do from you in a minute. Um, Jade, do you have a favorite woman in science? I do. So I'm actually a graduate of the Zoo Animal Technology Program, which is the program that's hosted here at the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo. And I remember we started learning about some of the amazing conservation efforts that we do here at our zoo. And one is with Machi's tree kangaroos, which are pretty incredible if you have ever gotten to visit our zoo or do in the future. And uh, there was a scientist named Lisa Daybeck, and she started a program in the 80s at Woodland Park Zoo and she would travel to Papua New Guinea where Matthew's tree kangaroos are from. And she went there just to learn about tree kangaroos initially because they live high in cl cloud forests, thousands of feet up in elevation. And so we knew so little about them. And in that time, 
she realized that to help protect a species, you have to protect the humans that coexist with them. And so she created this program called the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program. And she goes there all the time, studies tree kangaroos, and then she's created these junior ranger programs. She set up hospitals, schools. Um, they train people that live in the villages to come back and be teachers and teach about tree kangaroos. And it's, it's just really incredible. And I said, that's what I want to do someday. And um, I'm really excited because in some way I do get to do some of that stuff. I I was asked to come on as the tree kangaroo education advisor for their species survival plan. So um, I'm really excited that I get to participate in that program in some way. And I got to meet her and they always say you shouldn't meet your heroes, but she totally, <laughs> she totally delivered. That's awesome. It sounds like you're in the perfect field. And um, yeah, Lisa sounds like a really great role model. Um, so Jade, I'm gonna turn it over to you now so you can come show us more about what you have going on at the zoo. Sure. Um, so yeah, hi everybody. I'm the conservation education curator here at the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo. So my job for the community is, um, you know, I get the wonderful opportunity to go out into the community and we do outreaches at libraries, schools, churches, really any community venues. Um, and then I'm, I'm kind of, when you come to the zoo, if you see educational signs, if you see keepers talking to you, uh, I'm the person kind of behind the scenes helping facilitate all of that so that you get the best experience possible. And um, what my job exists so, at so many zoos, every zoo, because it is the pillar of what we do, education, um, we, you'll, you'll have someone like me. But I, why I love my job here so much is that I get to mentor future zookeepers and scientists. So people that have a passion and they just need the tools to be the most effective at it. And it's extremely rewarding because I, you know, I get to, I, I get to kind of create a conservation culture here where we have zookeepers that are practicing what we preach. And we, cause we ask many people to change much about their daily lives to protect species all over the world. And so we wanna make sure that we, we come from experience when we're talking to you about those things. And um, we also wanna make sure that we're relating it to you. Where are you from? What do you do every day? What are the animals that inspire you? And how can we get you to protect something? And how can we protect something we don't love yet? So that's our job. That's our job to ignite your passion for a species. and. Um, maybe have a drive to make a difference for them in the wild. So that's a big part of what zoos do. One of the things that makes our zoo really special is we're accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Now, um, you've maybe not heard of AZA before, but if you think about the United States, there's about, oh, there's over 3,000 animal facilities that have some sort of certification, like a USDA certification, to make sure they have the minimum requirements for animal care. There's only 230 zoos around the country that are accredited by AZA. So we have extremely high standards for our animal wellness, for the conservation efforts that we do in the wilds and for education in our community. So um, we're the only teaching zoo on a college campus in the world, um, which is really cool right here in Gainesville. I mean, Gainesville's got all the places, you've got the Florida Museum <laughs> and you've got the teaching zoo. So it's really great when you come here, all the zookeepers are getting their degrees in zoo animal technology. So it's associate of science and they, we don't hire a single zookeeper. They are the ones working with the animals, but it's not enough just to get that hands-on experience. We wanna really make sure that they, they understand the why between behind everything that they do practically. So um, what we see is that they, if they're in our commissary making diets for our animals, we want them to understand nutrition. How did these diets get formulated? There is a scientist whose job is to look at the compounds within the diets of animals in the wild and try to replicate that into what we give our animals, which is a really, really huge task. And that's just to bring back Lisa Day back, uh, one of the newest things that the Species Survival Plan is doing is they just went, their last trip to Papua New Guinea, they collected over a hundred plants they believe that tree kangaroos browse on and they brought them back here. And there's a 
a researcher at one of the zoos in Ohio, and she's actually breaking it all down. And she's looking to see exactly those, those trace elements and nutrients that is in that diet so that we can create an even better one than we already have for our tree painters, which is really exciting. So um, that's just one of the jobs that it's zoo. Then if you're working with our birds here at our zoo, we take an aviculture class. And so uh, we're really lucky to have an instructor who has a breadth of experience working hands-on with a lot of different animals. Um, but we, you know, it, we have to truly understand their anatomy, their behavior. Um, we have to understand what's going on with them in the wild and how we might need to propagate them. We have a species here called the Guam rail, which was once extinct in the wild. And um, in the 1980s, they, they found that there were only about 20 left. And this was because an invasive species was introduced onto the island of, um, of Guam. And this, it was called the brown tree snake. And all these birds were flightless. Many were flightless. Many just had no way to combat a predator that had never existed there before. And um, there, there's a really amazing book called And No Birds Sing. And it tells the story of how all these birds sang one day and what it was like to go to the island and, and not hear that. But what's really amazing is scientists from all over the conservation community came together. Um, so we brought birds to AZA zoos, we bred them, and now we've actually had seven chicks that went back to the island and were introduced on a nearby island in Guam called Rhoda. And um, for the first time, just in 2019, they went from being extinct in the wild to critically endangered, which is still a big deal, but it was the only second bird in history to get off that extinct in the wild list. And the first one was the California condor, which also was bought back from the brink with the help of zoos. So um, what's really, really great is that zoos really do make an impact on saving species um, because we do have so many experts here that that is their, that is their mission and their goal. Um, and we have a lot of expertise. So, um, so everything you can think of, if you work with that type of animal, we make sure that you're taking classes that really help you understand the why of everything that we see so that we can give the best wellness we possibly can. Um, and a lot goes into helping a species and bringing it back from extinction. And I thought, actually she's on a mission here, I gotta go find her. Um, I thought the best way to kind of give you an idea of how many people have to get involved to help save a species, I'd introduce you to one we have that lives right here in Florida, um, a really amazing animal. You may have even had the honor of meeting. They've been around for millions of years, um, but you know, like many animals, humans kind of came into the picture and they're starting to have some problems and they are considered threatened here in Florida. And um, we are very honored that we get an opportunity to help protect this species. So I'm gonna turn my camera around and hopefully you can get, luckily we're gonna get to see a few of these guys. All right. So everybody meet the gopher tortoise. If you've never met one, they're pretty incredible. You can see three of varying ages and sizes. So Celeste here is a great example of what an adult um, gopher tortoise looks like. They're usually about nine to 11 inches long. And uh, one of the things that makes them so important is that they have epic, epic burrows. Um, if you look at these little feet in the front, those basically are shovels. They dig, and you can see they're kind of, luckily they can't dig out. We, we, can, we always, when we make enclosures, we recognize <laughs> the animal's abilities. So this wire goes down very, 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 very deep. Um, but these guys love to dig and they use their burrows throughout their lives to help protect them um, from forest fires, from cold weather. Um, they lay their eggs near their apron. They're very, very important. But um, what makes them extra important is that they're a keystone species. I'm wondering if anybody in the chat maybe could tell me what they think a keystone species is. Okay. 
Any guesses? Yeah, someone said key to a uh, species that's key to the ecosystem. I mean, that's that's pretty true. Um, basically, if you take these guys out of their ecosystem, many plants and animals are affected. They've recorded over 350 species of animals that utilize the gopher tortoise burrow at some point in their life. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if gopher tortoises weren't here, Florida mice, burrowing owls, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, indigo snakes, opossums, so many animals would not have the opportunity to seek refuge when they needed it. Um, so these guys are essential. So they're considered a keystone species, which is why it is so important that we protect them. So what is our role here at a zoo? So um, we are actually, these guys kind of home away from home for a while. Now to think about the scientists that um, come into play here, um, I like to think about good Samaritans as scientists. Um, so if you're a person from the community that found an injured gopher tortoise like Celeste here, let's, let's tell Celeste's story. Celeste, you might notice is missing one of her limbs. Um, we believe she had a run-in with a dog. And so um, a good Samaritan made an observation, um, which is, something all scientists do. And they made an observation and they recognized that she had an injury. And so they brought her to the University of Florida veterinary practice and they, the, the vets there assessed her. So they have boundless knowledge and taken tons of training. And they're the scientists that recognized what was wrong with her and how to help uh, treat her injuries. And so she did get an amputation. Um, now, we talked about these guys being amazing burrowers. That would be a really big deal if we were to lose a limb, um, if your job is to dig burrows. And so they needed a place where Celeste could heal and not worry about predators, the elements. Um, and so that's our job. That's where the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo came in. And we have our scientists here who have, um, we worked with gopher tortoise a lot. We understand their behavior. We understand their needs. We understand what they, um, what they need to eat. And so we, we're able to take care of them every day and give them the medications that they need and assess their help. Well, every two weeks, our veterinarians come and give a little checkup on these guys to make sure they're doing well. And we have had the opportunity to release some of these animals back into the wild. But we're not the only ones that can help them. Um, really, you guys can too, because you have that chance to see them in the wild, you could actually help them if they need it. So um, one of the regulations used to be you could never touch these guys, but they did modify it because car run-ins are such a common issue for them. Uh, you can, as long as it's safe, um, if you're with your, your, your family, you would want to make sure an adult is with you to help you with this looking both ways. If you saw a gopher tortoise cross the road, you could pick it up and help it out to the other side in the direction that it's going. You also wouldn't want it to bring it to water because they're terrestrial animals, which means they live on the ground. They might live near coastal areas. And there's been some really cool videos I've seen where they might go right at the ocean's edge just to cool off a little bit, but they are not swimmers. They are diggers. So if you find one, you can't put it in your car and go move it somewhere else. Um, you can only help it go the direction it's going just on the other side of the road because they, they're, they're one track five, trust me. They'll always go where they're trying to go. Um, so you guys can really, really help. And if you have one in your backyard, think about Celeste's story. Think about is your dog going to aggravate that animal um, and make sure that you're protecting those species around you. So that's just one example of an animal where we have many people that come into play to protect them. And here at the zoo, we get to play an important role in that as well. Thank you so much, Jade. That was amazing. Absolutely. I love hearing the story of Celeste. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if anyone has questions, I saw quite a few coming in for Jade and we'll get to those um, at the end of the program. Um, thank you, Jade, so much. Thank you. I look forward to answering your questions at the end. Awesome. Oh, and thank you, Celeste. <laughs> All right, um, next up, our scientist is Maria. Maria, are you, can, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. I'm going to share awesome. my screen. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen, Maria. And um, while you're doing that, um, I'm going to ask Maria the same types of questions I asked Jade at the beginning. So um, Maria is actually a PhD candidate in um, the Soltis lab actually here at the Florida Museum. Um, so Maria, can you tell us what, what made you want to be a scientist? Sure. So I have this photo here in my slide um, on purpose. And it's, I think lots of people will think, well, maybe that's a little cheesy, but that's the truth of it. I uh, fell in love with plants. So that's why I decided to study them because I had a very, very special um, professor in college. And the way she talked about plants was just, it was just adorable. Like she made everyone in the classroom really pay attention and learn about like incredible things. And I was just, okay, this is what I want. Like, this sounds so exciting that this is really what I want to do. And so I started looking at them closely and trying to understand them and how they're related to each other. And then it was just helpless. <laughs> That's great. I know a lot of people love plants, but not everyone decides to become a plant scientist. So you took it all the way and I, and I admire you for that. Um, Maria, do you have a favorite woman in science? I do. So Katherine Johnson for me is one of like, I mean, it's hard to pick up one person, right? Because there's so many special ladies out there. But she was one of the first African American scientists um, to work for NASA. And she was a very special mathematician. So all her calculations were super important to uh, launch space shuttles. And I, at least when I was growing up, um, I, I grew up around some people that thought that women couldn't do math. And so to me, have such an important lady that was like rocking the mathematics and like bringing people to space. To me, when I learned about her, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. I wish I had known that I could do that when I was you know, younger. Not that I would do it, probably not, but it's just to like, tell us that we can do anything. Women can do anything. Yeah, that's awesome. Katherine Johnson's amazing. Um, and I like that you put the movie on there too. So you can you can definitely learn a lot more about Katherine Johnson. Yeah, that movie is amazing. Please, <laughs> please, if you have a chance, watch this movie. It's going to change your mind about these special ladies. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Maria. Do you want to go ahead and tell us more about what you do in your plant science? Sure. Awesome. So as I told before, I am in love with plants. And probably my favorite plant here in Florida is the Spanish moss. And I brought one today here. So as you can see, I don't know if you can see it very well. I think you can. But yeah, I just love them very, very much. I think they're very special. So I think everybody here has probably seen them hanging around on oak trees, um, whether it's a sunny day or it's a you know rainy day. I think they look beautiful either way. So I just think they're very, very special. And they're very mysterious as well. So what is a Spanish moss? It's called a moss, uh, but is it really a moss? Is it Spanish at all? Like, I think we, we posted the poll here. Have we posted the poll on the chat? Oh yeah, there you go. So just focus on the first question. We're going to get to the other one later. But what do you think is the Spanish moss? We have four options here. A plant, a moss, an animal, or none of the above. So I see one person answered. We have more. Okay, more people are coming in. So none of the above. Okay, more moss, more one person plan. Okay. Let's wait just a few more seconds. Okay, more people are coming in with plant. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the polling for now. Um, but 
the Spanish moss is actually a plant. And I know that sounds a little weird, but you get to understand about it in a minute. So yes, it's a plant and it's an epiphyte. An epiphyte, like what is that? So an epiphyte is a plant that lives on top of another plant. So if you've seen plenty of Spanish moss on the oaks and you know that oaks, the oaks are plants, then you can see that they live on top of the oaks, but they don't harm the oaks. They just need to be there because they don't have roots. The Spanish moths have no roots. They have this flower that it's greenish and not super exciting, not like a colorful orchid or a lily, but it's a flower nonetheless, but they have no roots. So how do they get nutrients if they don't have roots? Like, how does that make any sense? I thought, you know, roots were important to get nutrients. That's what everybody keeps telling me, but they're not all of it. So the Spanish moss is covered, its leaves are covered in these scales. So they're called peltate scales. And these scales are super important to trap water and nutrients. So they get all their water from little droplets that fall on the leaves and then get trapped by these scales. So you can see them in detail here in this slide. And then this would be how they would work. So when it's dry, the scale is flapped to the outside. And when it's like raining or you there are a couple of droplets on the surface of the leaf, then the scale traps these droplets and then it gets absorbed by the plant. Pretty cool, right? I think it's pretty amazing. Okay, so now that we know the Spanish moss is a plant and we can uh, throw that poll again and we can go to the second question. Um, what other plant is it related to? Because, you know, plants are related to other plants, just like we have siblings and parents and cousins. Plants also have families and it sounds a little weird, but that is true. So do we have the poll again? Can we put it again? Oh, there we go. Thank you. So go to question number two and you can see there are four options. So magnolia, oak, pineapple and rose. So what do you think to what plant is the Spanish moss related? Mm, I can see there is a couple of answers to magnolia, a couple to oak, a couple to pineapple. Mm, interesting. Pineapple is winning. I wonder. Let's see if there's any more answers. Yes, that's what we have for now. Okay, I am happy to see the results for this because you have it right. The Spanish moss is related to a pineapple. I know it's it's very interesting, but the family actually that it's the family for which the pineapple belongs and the Spanish moss, it's called a bromeliaceae. So bromeliaceae is the name of the plant family. And we have bromeliads like this one that you see on the slide. That's the more typical bromeliad. And then you have Spanish moss, you have the pineapple and you have many other uh, bromeliads. And you can see here the pineapple. Who likes pineapple? Let's just take a moment and look at the chat. Yes, Penny likes pineapple. I love, yes, I love pineapple too. Okay, cool. Okay, many people like it. Awesome. Caitlin as well. All right, Kara. Your brother does, Amy. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so look at the pineapple growing on 
it's planned. Isn't that amazing? Like, would you ever imagine that it looked like that? Like when you go to the grocery store and you buy a pineapple, would you imagine that that's how it grows? They are not like the plant itself. It's not that much. It doesn't look that much alike as a Spanish moss, but not all siblings look alike, right? Not all cousins and family look alike, but they're still family. Oh, cool. There's people that have three pineapple plants. That's awesome. Very cool. Okay. All right. So now that we've learned a little bit about the Spanish moss, um, you can find more activities about it on the booklet that we produced. That is um, like an addendum to the, the book that um, the Girls Do Science book. And I think our assistant is sharing the link. Yes, thank you. The chat assistant shared the link to the booklet. So there's more um, activities for the Spanish moss. There's activities for magnolia, for um, carnivorous plants, and for the beautyberry plant. So if you want, if you really love plants and you want to do some fun, fun activities, you can download this booklet. And we also have in the main book a coloring page with these plants. And I also recommend checking out this um, video on YouTube that is a Spanish mastery. So if you don't follow this channel on YouTube, it's a very fun channel. So it's called Ellie and Coco Science Show. And it's a, this very amazing scientist that takes her dog on very, very fun um, adventures to learn more about science. And this video is just amazing. So I really recommend anyone that would like to learn more about the Spanish moss to check it out. And I think I'll see you around maybe. And thank you. And um, there's just a final slide with references to the images in the presentation. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can contact me as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maria. I love learning about Spanish moss because even sitting from my computer right now, as soon as I look out the window, I see Spanish moss immediately. So it's it's something that's all around us, especially if anyone, um, I know a lot of you are watching from Gainesville. So really cool to learn more about them. Yeah, um, and, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. And um, I see we have some questions coming in and we will get to those um, at the end. Um, and now we're going to have, we have two more scientists, so just hang with us for two more and then we can get to those questions. Um, but next up we have Tyler Bowling. And Tyler, um, if you can't tell from what's hanging behind him in his Zoom room, um, Tyler is a shark scientist. So he's the manager of um, manager of the Florida Program for Shark Research. Um, and he is also a part of the Florida Museum of Natural History. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you and thank you all for coming. Yeah, so Tyler, before before you tell us all about shark stuff, um, my question to you is what got you interested in science? So when I was only a toddler, about two years old, I saw a National Geographic program called Jewels of the Caribbean, and it was all about coral reefs. And I was just fascinated by this. And I asked my parents to watch it again and again. They end up getting uh, VHS tape so I could watch it over and over and I just fell in love with the ocean and very quickly I, I figured out that sharks were my favorite they're just the the ultimate predators they had evolved all of these cool abilities and features and so at the ripe old age of, of three I decided that I was going to study sharks and get my PhD Wow, that's awesome. You actually carried through with it. Um, while I was watching 101 Dalmatians over and over and I never got 101 Dalmatians. So I think you're on the right track there. Um, <laughs> so Tyler, do you have a favorite woman in science? I do. Uh, so Dr. Eugenie Clark, she was probably the most famous shark scientist of all time. I grew up watching her on those National Geographic shows and she would always seem so kind and so smart and her passion for sharks was just infectious. I just was so excited to see what she was going to do because unlike other shows where they were just kind of telling you random facts about sharks, whenever she was on, we got to see what she was doing in her research. 
And I was really fascinated by this. And one of her, you know, projects that I thought was so cool as a kid was her work with the Moses sole, which is a type of flounder. So one of the flat fish, so they live in the sand. Well, this uh, flounder produced this like goo that was a natural shark repellent. And she was trying to see if she could produce that same chemical in a lab to use to help people stay safe uh, at the beaches. And so uh, as I grew up, I learned more and more about her uphill battle as a female scientist because she got her doctorate in uh, marine biology in 1950. And so most of scientists at that time and all of the shark scientists were, were men and they weren't very welcoming to her. And, but she never listened to those bullies and she went on to be the best shark scientist in history and did an incredible amount of science. Her work is still very important and relevant today to modern scientists. And a lot of people like to uh, show their appreciation for her by naming species after her. The most recent was in 2018, uh, there was a new species of dogfish, which is a small species of shark and they named it Genie's Dogfish. It's Latin name, which is what scientists use uh, so that we don't confuse it with her or anything else. It's a special name it was Squalus Clarkey. So the last bit was for her last name, Eugenie Clark. That's so cool. Yeah, and I'm gonna put um, in the chat, if anyone, um, some of you may have come to our shark event that we did in December that we talked more about Eugenie Clark. So I'll put the link to that in the chat. So you guys, if you wanna learn more about Eugenie Clark specifically, you can watch that video. Um, all right, Tyler, so I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell us more about what you do. Um, sharks. Okay, so I work at it's all you. Okay, so I work at the Florida Program for Shark Research, which includes the International Shark Attack File. And so we investigate whenever someone is bitten by a shark anywhere in the world. And so we get calls from folks or we reach out to people whenever there's an incident and we work with the local police and the doctors or local scientists to try and get an idea of how this happened. And then we try to reach out to the person who got bitten or someone who saw it happen. And we see who was at fault and why did this happen? And we use that information to try and inform um, safety protocols for the beaches so that we can tell people when it's safe to swim and when it's not safe to swim and what to do if they see a shark. And so a lot of times what we try to do is uh, figure out who was involved. So we talk to the people that got bit and we see what they describe the shark is looking like. And we can also look at some of the evidence left behind. And for example, this is a tiger shark. So it's got these really cool curved teeth. And we can see uh, kind of the characteristics for these jaws. And we can see if we can figure out who uh, bit who. And then we can see if they were provoked so let's say a person was maybe messing with a shark, like somebody tried to hug a shark and the shark didn't like it, or if they weren't doing uh, anything wrong. And so what we try to do is figure out how these sharks are moving and near shore. And then what we do is we go out and we tag the sharks. And so do any of you know uh, what species of shark migrates by the thousands on Florida's Atlantic coast each spring and fall, so in the ocean? You can answer in the chat. No, I'm not seeing too many. So I'm seeing some really good guesses, but it's the, the black tip shark. And these guys are actually, this cutout on the wall next to me is a, that of a black tip shark. And so we see them migrate in tens of thousands. And so they, they spend some of the year up in North Carolina, and then they spend their winter down in the Florida Keys, so the bottom of the state here. And so one of our current projects is we're trying to see uh, why that some people at New Smyrna Beach, which is kind of in the, the middle of the state here in Florida, why so many people are getting bitten by these sharks. And so we're going out and we catch these sharks. And I've got kind of an example of a shark line. 
And so we got this really big hook. You guys see that? See how big that hook is? It's a lot bigger than what you'd normally go fishing with. And this is only for about a six foot shark. We get much bigger hooks. And so this line is kind of scaled down. And so we've got kind of a double thick line so they can't bite through it. And then this line right here, which is really short, but this would normally be 10 to 20 feet long. And we've put these off on what are called drum lines. And so it's got this big weight at the bottom and it's attached to a float and it's attached to a larger version of the line I just showed you. And so what we do is, so the shark is caught on the line and it can't get away from that weight, but it has these swivels. So these little things that turn all the way around. And so they can just swim around the baited lines. And so that way they can get water over their gills because they have to breathe. And we go up to them with the boat and we pull them up close and we can tie them up so they don't get hurt struggling. And then we can tag them. And it, depending on what we're trying to look at, we can use different types of tags. So for example, on a really small shark, we'd use what's called a dart tag. And it has a little barb and it has a lot of little tiny words on it. And so that way, if somebody catches this shark again, our phone number is on here and they can tell us where they caught the shark and things about the shark. And we can even list things on this little tag in really tiny print that we want them to look at. So for example, it might say measurement. So can you measure the shark for us? Physical condition and location. So when they call or they send us an email, they can tell us. And we try to tag the sharks at the base of their dorsal fin, which is their top fin. And so this is for the really tiny sharks. Now a bigger shark needs a bigger barb. And so this will go under the skin and it's actually not that painful. They don't have a lot of uh, nerves, so they don't feel it very much. And sharks also can heal really, really fast. And so this is the same type of thing, but it's a little bigger and it's got a nice big barb on it. And then if you've ever watched Shark Week or another shark program like on National Geographic, they always talk about tracking the sharks and you can actually see where the sharks are moving. So if we put a tag that has a GPS on it, we can actually track it with a satellite. Another type of track, track tagging, excuse me, another type of tagging is called acoustic tagging, where we actually will implant this little tiny transmitter. See, it's pretty tiny. And we put that in the tummy of the shark and it sends out this special frequency of sound that we actually can't hear. And it's picked up by these machines that we put on the bottom of the ocean. And when it gets close to those machines, it logs it. So it can say shark A was here on February 14th, 2021 at this time. And that can give us an idea about how these sharks are moving. And so what we can do is use all of this information with kind of weather records. So was it rainy that day? Was it hot that day? To see where these sharks are going and when. And so that can help us protect people at the beaches. And so if somebody was going to go at a time where we thought there'd be more sharks closer to shore, we could give them a, a warning, like have a warning when they walk, walked onto the beach, like a sign or a flag. And so we can keep people safe. Now, sharks don't really bite people all that often but our job is to try and make it even less. So you've got uh, about a one and 300 million chance of being bitten by a shark. That's pretty low, it's not worth worrying about. But I can teach you some really cool things that'll even lower those odds even more. So don't swim at dawn or dusk. So those really low light hours where the sun's just coming up or going down, that's when a lot of sharks are out hunting for food. And so you don't want to be out there too, because they might get confused and not be able to see very well, and you could get in the way. Uh, don't swim where there's bait fish. So those tiny fish that are real uh, shiny, they're usually about that blog and they're different species. And that's what a lot of sharks like to eat. So don't swim if you see a bunch of bait fish or if someone is fishing. So if someone's got a fishing pole, it's probably not good to swim where they're, they're fishing either. You want to avoid wearing jewelry because remember those shimmery fish? Well, if you've got something shiny, the shark might want to check it out. 
And so a lot of these sharks are up in the waves and they can't see very good. So they make mistakes because a lot of shark bites are not intentional. They're accidents because the shark's not actively looking for you. They're looking for fish. And so that they can make a, a pretty easy mistake. And also, I would say that if you ever see a shark, don't panic. Uh, you just need to back away slowly. And if you're underwater and you have goggles, you look at the shark and you look at it in the eyes. So predators in general, whether it be a cat or a shark, they, they don't like to see uh, another animal's eyes when they're trying to check it out because it means that you're aware of them. And so they'll be a little bit more cautious. It's also helpful to go swimming with a buddy. So you've got some more eyes and you've always got somebody there to help you. And it's also a good idea to not splash for really long times. So when a fish is in trouble and it doesn't, and it's hurt, they flap around, right? If you've ever caught a fish and, and if you've put it on your boat or on the shore, you've, it, they flop around. And so these create these low frequency sounds in the water so that the sound of them uh, splashing and sharks know that, oh, that sounds like a fish in trouble. Well, if you spend a lot of time splashing in one spot, the shark might think that there's a fish in trouble. And so they'll go check it out. So avoid splashing for long periods. Um, and so we use all of this information that we've been collecting and, and we're out at New Smyrna Beach, but we've been a little delayed because of COVID but we're hoping to get out there soon. And we're also using uh, drones. Uh, so if you've ever seen a drone on TV, so they're little flying things, so we can actually take videos of the sharks so it's not all tagging. And so that way we can actually see how many sharks are in shore when, and we can observe the sharks that are tagged and the sharks that are not tagged. And we can see dozens and dozens of them. And what we think is going on, why there's so many sharks that are biting people in that area is because they're actually baby sharks. And babies make a lot of mistakes because they're still learning. And so these sharks are only two or three feet long and they're born at about two feet long. So they're not very big. And so this kind of reinforces again that most shark bites are, are accidents. So remember, those safety rules, which you can find at our website, which has been put in the chat. And I thank you guys for uh, listening and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, we already have so many questions. Um, one question I'm gonna ask you now, cause this is one I know will always come up is what, just real quick, what is your favorite shark? <laughs> <laughs> um, so favorite shark uh, for me honestly changes regularly but i would say that if i had to pick one uh it always comes back to tiger shark so this jaw right here so these sharks are so cool um they'll bite just about anything because they like to see what it is because remember they don't have hands so they've got to chew on it to see what it is and they just sort of break all the rules they don't they don't seem to care and they they can just go real slow or real fast. You never know what a tiger shark is going to do. So that's why I kind of like them. They're unpredictable. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler, for sharing your shark knowledge. We'll get back to some questions with you at the end because um, I do want to get one more scientist in. So next up, we have Fiona. Fiona, are you are you out there? <laughs> hey, Tassie. Yeah, I'm right here. Awesome. So Fiona is a graduate researcher and she is in the UF Department of Microbiology and Cell Science. So Fiona is going to show us some really small things today, which I'm excited about. Um, yeah. Fiona, what made you um, want to be a scientist? So yeah, I love that question because it's so different for, for everybody. Um, for me, I never thought I was going to be a scientist. Um, and then I got to college and I was going to study horticulture because me, I just like Maria, I love plants. Um, but then I started getting into molecular biology. I, I mean, it's just magic. It's honestly magical how these tiny little things come together and they make something like you or like a plant or like your dog. and you know, ever since, you know, I started really starting to understand chemistry, uh, I've wanted to study it and I've, I'm stuck now, you know? <laughs> awesome. And do you have a favorite woman in science? I actually have two. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a really 
great picture of them. If you'll give me one second. Here we go. Can everyone, can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Great. So um, my two favorite, most inspirational women in science right now are going to be Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. Um, both of these women actually received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year uh, for discovering some gene editing technology uh, called CRISPR-Cas9. And maybe that's a little bit, you know, uh, abstract, but what it really is is just a tool that we can use as molecular biologists to edit the genome and not just the genome in simple organisms like bacteria or archaea, but in complicated organisms like you and like plants. So um, their work is just absolutely revolutionary uh, for people who work with molecular biology and microbiology. Um, but it's, it's also a story about cooperation and collaboration because their labs worked uh, in tandem to actually develop the technology. And so um, they, they shared the Nobel Prize. And I think that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, and here's a picture of them accepting the award. That's awesome to have. Seems like they have a great friendship and a great science relationship too. That's really cool. Um, all right, I we really want to hear more about your work now, Fiona. Okay, yeah. All right, so uh, microbiology, right? So our slogan is uh, "Let's get cultured," which I think is super sweet. And I just wanted to start with a, a picture. This is an electron microscope image of a soil microbe. Uh, called Pseudomonas fluorescens. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because he's warm and fuzzy. And I feel like bacteria get a pretty bad rep, you know, they can get us sick. Um, but the vast majority of them are actually there um, around you. You can't see them, you can't touch them, or well, you can't, but you don't know you're touching them. <laughs> but they're there to help you. And they're there actually making um, life possible. So Pseudomonas fluorescens, he lives in the soil. And he helps plants um, sort of maintain nutrient cycles and so on and so forth. So what I really wanted to impress upon everyone today is just um, how ubiquitous microbes are. I mean, they are everywhere. We only, like right now, we only know about a trillion species, but we estimate that we still don't know about over 99.999% of what actually exists. So microbes are everywhere. They're in the air, they're in clouds, they're in soils, they're in glaciers, they're just everywhere. They're inside of you too. And if they weren't inside of you, you know, you'd have some really pretty big issues. They help you metabolize. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but they help you metabolize and they keep you healthy and everything. And they do the same thing for plants and animals and, you know, marine organisms like sharks, like we just talked about. Um, so, okay. So this kind of begets the question, right? So if they're everywhere, you know, you have more bacteria on the inside of you than you have human cells. So if they're everywhere, how come we can't see them or we can't touch them? You know, if there's more of them in me and I can see me, why can't I see them? And then if we can't see them, how do we study them? So what we're going to do today, and I'm really grateful to the teaching labs here at uh, Microbiology and Cell Science because we've got some really cool technology is we're actually going to take a look in a microscope um, so that we can get a handle on how big bacteria are and how they manage to fit inside of you and inside of the air and everywhere and we don't even realize that they're there. So the first thing I wanted to look at is actually not a microbe and it's uh, not a bacteria. It's a micro animal. His name, is, we call him a water bear, but what he actually is, is a tardigrade. Um, and he lives in stagnant water or lakes and ponds and in the algae. And he's just adorable. They have like eight legs and they just go about their lives eating algae and stuff. So really quickly, I'm gonna stop my share and jump over to my mic uh, microscope so that we can take a look at a tardigrade. So give me just one second. All right, everyone can hear me? Great. 
Okay, so you're looking at an actual live microscope right now. And right here, we have a tardigrade and he's being kind of slow. I bet I can find another one. Here's one right here. All right, do you see him moving around? Let me see if I can get him in better focus. So right now we're actually magnified 100x. So this is 100 times closer than what we could see with our eyes. And oh gosh, you see him eating his little algae? Oh, I love him or her, them, it. And they just move around and live their happy little life. But okay, so why am I showing you a tardigrade? So the reason I'm showing you the tardigrade is because I want you to understand how big they are relative to, <laughs> thanks. So I wanted you to understand how big they are relative to some things that might be a little bit more familiar. So here we go. Okay, so here's a penny. We've all seen a penny before. And on top of the penny is my new favorite animal. He's actually the world's smallest frog. Yeah, he's so cute with his little eyes. And then next to that frog, we have the size of an average drop of water. And I think we've all seen the droplets before. And the teeny tiny little speck at the very bottom, that is the tardigrade that we just saw magnified a hundred times in my microscope. Okay, so he's really, 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 really small. All right, let's move to the next layer of sizes. So we have a tardigrade about half the size of a drop of water. How big is a human cell relative to that? So uh, earlier today, I actually swabbed my cheek and I used some dyes that we use um, in microbiology to visualize cells. Um, specifically safranin and crystal violet. And um, your cheek cells actually dye this really pretty kind of orangey pink color. Um, and I really want you to take a look here. So there's actually two cheek cells in this image. Uh, they're both nice and pink, but then you see these darker dots in the middle. Those are actually the nuclei of the cell. So you can actually see the nuclei where all the DNA of that cell is packed up and stored in that nucleus. You can see it after you dye it. So again, I'm going to jump over to my microscope and we're going to take a look at my actual cheek cells. So give me just a second. Okay, so we're back with my microscope. I'm gonna just take my slide off and grab my cheek cells. So here we go. We're a little out of focus. I'm gonna take it back. All right, so you can see that there are these little red, pink dots everywhere. Those are actually my cells. So I wanna find one that looks really nice so that y'all can see the nuclei. Let's see, let's see. I'm gonna get a little closer, All right? So this is back to a hundred times. I'm focused, there we go, perfect. So there you see a cheek cell. That's my cheek cell right in the middle. Let's see if I can find one that looks more like my picture. Some of them get a little damaged when you swab your cheek. So there you can go ahead and you can see them a little better. And those little, the dark dots in the middle, those are the nuclei. So they're really, really, really cool. Really cool. So, okay, so let's put this in some perspective. So here's my cheek cell magnified 100X. How big is this cheek cell relative to the tardigrade we just saw? All right, so I'm gonna hop back over. Okay. All right. So I have done the math and here's our tardigrade. I've made him super, super big so that we can put him in some context. 
Um, there's the tardigrade and all the way that tiny little pink dog in the corner. So that's the cheek cells that I just showed you relative to my tardigrade. So if we go back and we look at the penny. So there's our penny, there's our frog, there's the drop of water, there's the tardigrade. And if that tardigrade is this big, that's how big my cheek cell is. So it's, we're getting pretty small, right? We're getting pretty small. Now the question was posed, what about bacteria? Right, we're here to talk about bacteria. So I wanted to show my last microscope slide, I wanted to show you um, some E. coli that I stained with the same dyes as my cheek cells earlier. Um, and I wanna put that in perspective uh, to my cheek cells. So let's go ahead and jump right back to the microscope real quick. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take my cheek cells out and I'm going to put on some E. coli. So a lot of what you've heard, I'm sure, about E. coli is that it's pathogenic and it can be, but in the lab and in microbiology, E. coli is actually really useful. They call it the workhorse of molecular biology. All right, there we go, perfectly in focus. Hmm, that spot doesn't look super good on my Moody cam though. All right, that should do. So right now you see kind of like grayish funk. That's actually bacteria. So this is, uh, this is at um, 40X. So this is 40 times what you're seeing, what you would see with your eyes. But let's get a little bit closer. And I can focus that. There we go. Okay, so you're starting to see kind of a pattern. So bacteria like to associate with each other. They like to hang out in specific little clusters and patterns. And you can sometimes use that to identify the bacteria that you're working with. But we need to get a little closer to see what's actually going on with these E. coli. All right, so we are now at 400 times what you would see with your eyes. And you can see that they're starting to look a teeny bit pink, but we're still not all the way there, but you can see that they're clustered up next to each other and very distinct patterns. They look like little spider webs, right? Okay, let's get one step closer. I will warn you that sometimes the closest magnification can be a little finicky and you have to use oil to get the magnification right. So here we go. And you might see a little bubble while the oil kind of settles and is happy and ready. And then we have to focus him again. I wish you could see my microscope so you could see how I'm focusing. Oh, I see something. Oh, missed him. Almost. There we go, perfect. Okay, so now you can see that they're definitely pink and they are definitely rod shaped and they are definitely hanging out with each other. So this is what E. coli looks like. You can see some of them are individual little specks. So that's one bacteria. And then they kind of like hang out with each other and make these little communities um, and everything. So, but one little speck, that's one bacteria. Okay, so I wanna put this in the perspective of how big this is relative to my cheek cell. So I'm gonna jump back over to the PowerPoint. All right. Okay. So this is my cheek cell that I blew up just like I blew that tardigrade up. And you can see that he's real big now. And in this tiny little dot down here at the corner, those are actually the bacteria that I just showed you. So bacteria are really, 
really, really, really small. I'm not even going to give you a measurement because this is kind of just the best idea I can give you. But it does make sense how trillions of them can live on the inside of your stomach and you would never know, right? So I was telling you earlier, we were going to talk a little bit more about what microbes do for you. Um, and the one thing that has happened in research recently is we've started thinking about the microbiome gut brain axis. And what does that even mean? What it means is you have microbes that live in your gut and help you metabolize. But most importantly, they help you make a specific chemical called serotonin that actually tells your brain you know, to make happiness, to be happy, to be joyful. Um, and they've discovered that this actually affects so many different things of your life. You can, you know, depending on what you eat and depending on what your microbiome is, you can have different social interactions, you can have different uh, stress levels and fear levels. So this is just a little reminder that bacteria make you happy, <laughs> good ones in your gut make you happy. And, you know, you really are what you eat, right? And just as a last thing, um, I just think microbes are impossibly cool. There are so many amazing things recently, um, microbes that can degrade uh, plastics that were previously uh, non-biodegradable. And you know, on the other side of things, there are microbes that can make biodegradable plastics, um, even microbes that you know, make biofuels so we can have alternative energy sources. Um, Recently, they've identified a microbe that can, they believe, could survive in space. So microbes are sort of like the stepping stone to understanding what life might look like on other planets. Um, and as a very last thing, microbes can even be art. So you guys see, you see all of these little petri dishes. So all of these are different um, arts that people have made using only microbes growing on plates. And um, just because it's Valentine's Day. Uh, I made everybody a little microbe art. Can you see him? Oh, in the shape of a heart. There he goes. And I made some little stars and suns too. So microbes are good for everything. They're good for absolutely everything. I think guys, that's everything I had. Thank you so much, Fiona. That was awesome. I, I, I don't know if everyone um, recognized the fact that Fiona was running back and forth for all of you to show you those amazing things on both her screens. So okay, applause it wasn't for that. that far, though. It was nice. <laughs> I, I don't think that was exercise. So this was good for me. Yeah. Well, we have, um, we have only about 15 minutes and I have more questions that I've ever gotten for any program. So we're going to try to do this kind of in a speed round. Um, so Tyler and Fiona and Jade, if you want to turn your cameras back on, I have some questions for all of you. Um, and I'm going to start with a question to Jade first. Um, Jade, I have like three kind of quick questions. So we're going to see if we can get through these, um, okay. get through these as quick as we can. Um, so Jade, we have lots of people asking about numbers at the Santa Fe Zoo. So sure. Penny is asking how many animals are at the zoo. And then Danielle is asking how many people work at the Santa Fe Zoo. Oh, awesome. So we, we have about 70 different species here at the zoo. And right now we're at about 200 individual animals. So we have quite a few animals here. Wow, that's a lot. Um, as far as people goes, our full-time staff, we only have about nine people. Um, and then we have uh, another five instructors that help our students when they're in lab working with the animals. And then we accept a new cohort every other semester. So we kind of fluctuate between about 80 to 120 zookeepers at one time. Cool. Sounds like your uh, zookeepers have a lot of work to do with all those animals. <laughs> Um, and, and one more number is we see usually, except this year, obviously, about 60,000 visitors a year. Amazing. That's so cool. Um, and how many tree kangaroos are at the zoo? Do you have any there? Yeah, right now we have two tree kangaroos, Eki and Adelaide, and they are actually here because we're hoping that they will have a joey together so they can help grow our population of tree kangaroos. We're really excited. <laughs> That's adorable. Well, I hope that um, you let all of us in the public know if there if there is a Joey. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Um, Maria, this next question is for you. Um, is it bad for the trees when moss grow on it on them? No, it's not bad for the trees at all. 
you have some plants that grow on other plants that are called parasites and those plants can be harmful and what happens is that they suck in either water or nutrients or both from the host plant and then they can end up like sucking the life out of them or even sometimes there are some plants that strangle other plants and so that can be also very harmful but the spanish moss and no other moss do this not at all yeah and did you have something that you wanted to add to your presentation you want to tell us yeah yeah i just wanted to clarify something so the moss like mosses in general are plants the difference is that they don't produce flowers or fruits and they don't have like they're not very big because they don't have special cells to conduct water in their bodies but just to make sure because i asked you if like the spanish moss was a plant or a moss or something or an animal but i forgot to add the the word flowering plant so a moss is a plant but just it doesn't produce flowers whereas the spanish moss that has this confusing name is not a moss because it produces flowers so just to make 100 percent clear yeah thank you yeah we want to make sure we get our facts straight so it is a flowering plant and is it spanish or no it's not spanish it's not spanish it's, it's actually native to florida <laughs> so that's pretty cool fun oh fact. that's awesome i mean i'm happy to know it's native to florida it seems yeah. like many of my favorite plants and animals are it's um, native actually to the southeast i will check in a second to see the okay. distribution yeah you can add stuff to the, to the chat too okay i'll do that cool um so tyler we have a lot of questions here about sharks um so can you tell us um a little bit more about the likelihood of getting attacked by a shark is this something that we should be worried about um someone said they'd heard the fact of you're more likely to get an accident driving to the beach than attacked by a shark can you um answer that question sure so no that's absolutely right a, a car accident would be far more likely uh, you, you really don't have to worry about getting bitten by a shark and i, I told you guys a bunch of sick quick safety tips about how to reduce those already insane odds. They're super, super low. You're more likely to be struck by lightning than bitten by a shark. So it's, you can go in the ocean and feel safe. Great. So sharks are friends, not foes, <laughs> <laughs> but we don't hug them. Got no. it. <laughs> um, how many shark teeth have you collected? Is that something you do in your job? <laughs> We normally don't collect uh, individual shark teeth like you would go to like fossil hunt in the creeks. We do occasionally collect the jaws. And so that's a little different. Um, so, but in an individual jaw, depending on the species, there can be 100 to 300 teeth. Wow. And so what using those teeth, um, how many fish do they have to eat? Do they, what are their diets like? So it's very varied between species. Um, but most sharks uh, kind of eat a couple of times a week only. And, and this can range from uh, several fish to uh, if, if it was like a, a great white, they might eat like one seal and be done. Uh, so it's really not as common as you think. Ah, interesting. Um, and do sharks swim really fast? It depends on the shark. So some sharks like a mako shark, we have those in Florida. They can go almost 60 miles an hour. That's as fast as a cheetah or what most of the top speed limits are on the road. So driving in a car. But other sharks like a wobegong that they have out in Australia, they sit still all day long. They don't go anywhere. And when they do move, it's very slow. They're ambush predators. So they sit and wait for prey to uh to come by and they're camouflaged so they can't be seen very easily and then they spring into action interesting so cool um all right so i'm gonna ask a couple questions to fiona next fiona are you ready for a couple questions super ready awesome um can tardigrades survive in space yeah actually i think um Neil deGrasse Tyson said something along those lines. Um, and yeah, I believe so. I think the, the real question is how long? Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. I haven't read the paper that said anything like that, but they are super, super hardy creatures. I mean, 
they will live through like quite a lot of stuff. Like I'm gonna go take my my slide, which has been sitting out for a while. I'm gonna just rinse it off back into my little container of tardigrades, and they'll be fine. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that tardigrades they are super hardy. Um, the bacteria that I'm thinking of that they actually oh they did go to space. Oh cool. Well. <laughs> I assume they were in, in probably a little container with some moss and water and stuff, so they were happy. So that's really cool. They, yeah, actually, um, they have a program here at US that studies what happens to microbes when we send them to space. Uh, and it's actually really, really cool. Um, if you are interested in it, you can look it up. It's a partnership with NASA. Me. Um, do you happen to know how many cells are in a human body? I actually saw that question and Googled it because no, I did not know. I love <laughs> um, that. I mean, it's, I mean, <laughs> no, you can, we can't expect scientists to know everything. Especially, I'm a plant scientist too, so I uh, definitely wouldn't have that number off the top of my head, but it is approximately 32.7 trillion cells. Wow, that's a lot and, of cells. And, and you have more bacteria than 32.7 trillion in your body. That's crazy. Um, so one more question kind of about cells. So you showed us your cheek cell. So mm -hmm. I imagine that if you have cells on your cheeks on the inside, you probably swallow them. Is that true? And what kind of happens there? Yeah, I'm sure you swallow plenty of, uh, you actually do you swallow plenty of dead, uh, dead skin and dead uh, cheek cells um, just based on on what happens inside your mouth. I don't know if you've ever bit your cheek or whatever. Um, yeah. But also your skin regenerates faster than any other organ in your body. So including your mouth skin. I don't know if you've ever hurt your mouth. It heals a lot faster than other places. Um, but for the most part, it's not going to hurt you. Um, you've got a lot of stomach acid that's going to neutralize any bad bacteria for the most part. And, uh, then you just digest it and it goes back to being a part of you. So no harm, no foul. Wow. <laughs> so interesting. I love that. Um, <laughs> Jade, we had a question about what is a tree kangaroo? So we've been talking about them a lot. So I want to make sure everyone knows what they are. Yeah, so they're a marsupial. Uh, so they, they are a kangaroo, but they've been adapted to live in the trees. Um, so instead of the really tall kangaroos you're used to seeing from Australia, there are tree kangaroos that live in Australia, um, but you're probably used to the ones that have the really long, strong tails. They're really tall gray and red kangaroos. These guys are a little more squat. So um, they're just a couple feet tall. They have really long nails so they could scrape and jump around. They have squat legs and their tails, they just use for balance. Um, and what's really cool about them, they can jump from a tree to the ground 60 feet and not get injured because they are built for that impact, um, which is really cool. That's super cool, man. I wish I could do that. Um, you guys are going to have to come to the zoo to see them. They're, they're, um, right now, that part of our trail is closed due to the pandemic, but you can still see them from our pavilion and they usually position themselves in a nice place that you can, you can view them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I need to get back out there for sure. Um, so Tyler, a couple more questions about sharks, um, specifically about tagging them. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do when you tag a shark? Sure. Um, so I showed you guys the basic kind of tags. And so the, the dark tag, so it, it's got a little barb. And uh, this is a, a metal barb tag that goes up in the dorsal fin. So that is just a visible tag. It hangs. So the only part that's going in is the very tip. And so the rest of it hangs out and it's got little tiny words on it so that everybody catches the shark. Again, they know that we tag this animal and we want information about when they got it. And the other type of tag is that acoustic one, the one that goes inside the shark. And so what we do is we do a little tiny bit of surgery and it's, it's safe, we, we numb the shark and we, we pop it inside its, its tummy area and then the battery stays in active for anywhere from two to five years, depending on what we set it as. And, and then it just 
uh, goes dormant and it doesn't hurt the shark. There's been lots of studies to check and there's no harm. They heal up very, very fast. So even when we put a little toll in its tummy that it heals within a matter of weeks actually. Wow, that's really cool. And I know that in the um, activity book um, activity that you created, there's some websites you can check out so you can actually track some sharks. So um, for all of you in the audience, definitely look at that because um, it's really cool because you can watch and see where sharks are at any given time. Um, so how do you collect shark jaws? Is that something you just find or how do so you sometimes, how does that work? Sometimes when um, fishermen catch sharks and, and they, they don't uh, live, sometimes they die on the line. They could be donated to us or sometimes we might find a dead one on a beach and we can cut out the jaw and we can clean it up. And there's different techniques that we can use. Uh, so we can, you know, basically do the final steps with hydrogen peroxide. So if you've ever had a cut and it bubbles, we actually will soak the jaws in that and then we'll dry it outside. So we'll put it in kind of a, of kind of a brace with some wood. So we get it in the right shape and it dries just with airflow and then it's nice and stiff. Awesome. Yeah, I know shark jaws are really important to learning about sharks because the rest of sharks are mostly cartilage. Is that right? So, yep. So actually this, you know, the actual jaw is cartilage. The only hard part is the actual teeth, which is why we only really see the teeth fossilized. So cartilage is that kind of rubbery material that your ears and your nose are made out of. And so that doesn't preserve very, very well and just sort of rots away. Interesting. Um, Maria, this question is about collecting um, moss. Have you collected a lot of moss? No, unfortunately, moss is not my area of expertise, so I haven't collected a lot of them, um, but they're very delicate. And it's always like this was coming on on the chat. It's always good um, when you see local animals and, and plants not to transport them across places because we never know what impact they might may cause. Um, so it's and you also to collect plans for research, you need a special um, authorization that's called a permit. And then you can go into the wild with your permit and collect the plant and then store it in a proper museum that's called the herbaria. So it's a special museum for plants. So actually plants also have a, uh, um, a way to be stored and um, as animals get, that get tex textermized, plants get pressed, they get dried and pressed. And it's a really cool place to be in a herbarium. So if anyone is interested, there, we have a herbarium at uh, the University of Florida, which is huge, has many plants on display and you just have to give us a call and maybe we can talk more about it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, any tips for when you find um, big hunks of moss that maybe have fallen out of trees, what you should do with it? Can you put it back up in a tree? I I don't really know. I think depending on where, I mean, if it's on the middle of this tree, maybe just move it to the side to, to a place where It'll it's like, okay. yeah, like a grass placed or, or, some, or something. But I don't really think you should like move it somewhere specifically. Um, yeah. Cause it's just, I mean, there's nothing, there's not much you can do. Like you can, you can restitute the, the trunk to the tree, but just move it aside. And then probably the moss will continue to thrive. Um, if it's just in a humid place. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, so it is the end of our program here. And I want to thank everyone for attending and sticking with us through all these questions. Um, there are so many, and I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of them. Um, but thank you all for, for sitting with us today. And I hope you learned a lot about science and also how important um, women in science are to continuing um, research and learning about our world. Um, so thank you all very much. And thank you to all of our speakers for attending. Um, our chat assistant just put the survey in the link there and she's, she's posted it a couple times there. So if you don't mind just clicking that link and taking the survey for us so we can learn how you, how you felt about the event today. Um, so thank you all for attending and I hope we'll see you again at another event. Bye.